Hopefully, I'm not going to blow you out with volume. I have sort of a minimum speaking voice, and this is about it. So the, the feature frenzy. I used to do a state of post just talk, but I found I spent a lot of time on history and not enough time on features. So I boiled it down just to the feature frenzy. These are the things that post just can do. Uh, before I go any farther, some context about how I get to pay to do all the fun frenzy work. Um, so the, uh, the corporate slide here. So I work for CardiDB, geospatial on the cloud. Hiding underneath CardiDB is PostGIS. So CardiDB is an excellent tool for taking your data, putting it online into pretty maps. Uh, you can use it as an end user very easily, point and click your way to a web map in half a minute. Or you can use it as an advanced web developer, use the APIs in the platform to build whatever you want. Um, we've got lots of folks working on complex apps. We've got also, also lots of folks who are just publishing simple web maps. So go to cardodb.com and give that a try if you have a chance. So PostGIS is a spatial database, term of art. What do I mean by spatial database? I mean uh, it's a database, which is to say database has types. You know, it's, got, it's got indexes to make it faster to get data out of those types. It's got functions that let you manipulate those types. What's a spatial database? It's just all that except with spatial whacked in front of it. So it's got spatial types, geometries and geographies that understand where things are, spatial indexes to deal with the fact that those objects are range-based, not point-based, and they fall across multiple dimensions, and then functions, which understand that those objects have dimensionality and you can calculate fun, interesting things about them. In your professional life as GIS people, if you are GIS people, you'll run across real spatial databases from time to time. PostGIS is one, Oracle Spatial is another, SQL Server since 2008 has had a good, uh, a good spatial extension in it. Which is neat, but what does it do? What does it mean to have a spatial database? So it means you can answer questions that otherwise would be very difficult to answer in your database, like what parcels are within a kilometer of this fire? That sounds like a GIS question. Um, how do you answer that in a database like this? One line, um, if you count down to the semicolon, one line of SQL, and you got the answer to that classic GIS, give me an alert list of people to phone about the fire. Um, how far did the bus travel last week? That's a nice GIS question, bit of a location-based services flavor to it. How do you answer that question in your database? Again, one line of SQL. Sum up all the lengths of the, of the lines where the vehicle traveled since now minus seven days. Or, you know, classic county stuff. How much land is there in each zoning category? Again, one line of SQL. We can use SQL to summarize the whole data set in one go. So SQL in the database is very, very powerful. I think it's more powerful in desktop GIS in terms of amount of code required, in terms of the ability to automate it, to push results out onto the web. So where does Post just come from? It came from a little company I ran about 15 years ago. Um, I was not actually the, uh, the original developer. The original developer was this guy to my right in that picture, uh, Dave Blasby. But I've been a principal developer since 2008. And we developed the system because back in 2000, we were dealing with lots and lots of GIS files, and that is a pain in a place. And the files were really simple. It was just one file for each study area in, uh, in a treatment analysis we were doing. And it's really just the worst possible data management problem because people come to us and say, that one you gave us last week, tell us about that. I need a new analysis on that. Wouldn't it be easier if we just pivoted all that, we said to ourselves, and just put it in one table? So instead of one file per polygon, we ended up with one row per polygon. That seemed like it would make a lot more sense. So with that data model, we could then history, we could pull things out in aggregate, we could do all sorts of stuff we couldn't do when we were managing stuff as files. So the database gave it all kinds of advantages. We could query everything in one place. We could publish it out on the web. We had one language to access at SQL. So we brought out posters at the beginning. That was 2001. How did it go? Uh, release history. So once upon a time, 2001, first release. Just objects and indexes. Very shortly though after, we add functions. Now you can ask questions of the data. You can't just store it and retrieve it. Move on by November. This is only, what, two years later? Uh, simple features for SQL. That's the international standard for spatial databases. That's basically a whole spatial database at that point, 2003. So we haven't been doing much since then. Um, <laughs> two years later, lightweight geometry, a 1.0 release. That was basically a performance release in a lot of respects. Lightweight geometry just made our serialization smaller, so it was more efficient. Geography as of 1.5. That uh, brought us geodetic support. Talk about that later. Raster support in 2.0. 
and 2.1, our most re recent stable release, speed and polish. So you look at those releases and you might say something like, the release tempo appears to be slowing, should be worried, is the developer community drying up, are people getting tired, is the community drifting away? No, not really. I like to think that we're just asymptotically approaching perfection. <laughs> so, you know, eventually we'll get to post post just three. Actually, probably we won't um, for technical reasons, which I could explain, and I'll explain to you after if you're really interested. So, yet yeah, more history. Um, so we've gone since 2001 from sort of being a curiosity. What's that funny thing that those open source crazy people are doing to being more or less an industry standard? Uh, I'm noting more and more people who are talking about their spatial stuff is using PostGIS as the triangulation point. It's like PostGIS, but that's a pretty good sign that we've become kind of the industry standard for spatial databases. Um, back in the day, we were really only supported by open source software as third party users of the database. You know, the first few years it was GeoServer and MapServer and QGIS were our main software clients, but we got our first proprietary customer kind of within that, just getting to uh, complete feature completeness in 2003. But after then, things really started to pick up speed. We picked up some smaller proprietary companies as third party folks. All the open source geospatial software supported us. 2006 on, basically everyone arrived and said, okay, oh yeah, this is an important thing, we need to provide it. We got the, uh, the last, the straggler came in, Intergraph, the company formerly known as Intergraph, now known as Hexagon, um, added us as a supported database back in 2010. So we're widely supported by open source software, by proprietary software. And now, this is a sort of new piece of information, quite widely deployable. Uh, so you don't have to build and deploy your own Postgres anymore. You can spin up primitive instances using web services. Amazon Web Services offers it as part of their RDS. Heroku offers it as part of their Postgres offering. OpenShift offers it. So all these platforms of service offerings allows you to spin it up. And then, of course, there are softwares of service offerings, like the company I work for, CarterDB, that allows you to log in and use it directly without having to spin anything up at all. So why are these companies supporting Postgres? Because they believe in their hearts that open source software is the way things should be. <laughs> it's a differentiator. Um, for our first proprietary adopters, these are kind of small GIS companies, they adopted it because it allowed them to say, well, unlike these big guys, we support this fun little database that you use. And it allowed them to bring in customers who might otherwise go to somebody else. In the case of these guys, it actually won them a really big customer, the National Mapping Agency of France. That was pretty cool. But then, you know, as it became more popular, it became required as a basic feature. Even the big three, Esri, Map, Info, Intergraph, came on board because their customers said they want it. So, who's using PostGIS? Lots of customers out there on the private sector, WSI, known as the Weather Network, uh, the New York Times, InfoTerra, Digital Globe, SIIC, Ball, Aerospace, and the defense industry side, uh, startups like Redfin, Zonar. Governmental side, sure, national levels, French National Mapping Agency, Canadian National Mapping Agency, Portugal, regions like Minnesota and Quebec, local levels like Pierce County, and quasi-governmental outfits like NREL, Nav Canada, they all use PostGIS. So, that was that's sort of the background, but, uh, but that wasn't the frenzy. It's time to start the frenzy. Let's get some features. I like to start off with my number one feature of PostGIS, but actually I have three, three number one features of PostGIS. So, uh, the number one feature of PostGIS number one is freedom, liberty, right? You're here at Phosphor D. The most important feature is freedom. You can spin it up as many times as you want. You can change it. You can make it... Play a little sound, but important things happen. The freeze and freedom aspect lets you extend, deploy, and share it any way you want. The second fabulous feature. So I had a period for a couple years where I felt like the world was turning against me and I couldn't read anything on the web without reading about NoSQL. Oh my god, NoSQL. As far as I'm concerned, the number one feature of PostGIS from a spatial point of view and PostGRESS in a general purpose point of view is that it is a and a guest SQL database. <laughs> Why would we throw that out? Because when you have the power of yes SQL, you can answer questions like this without writing any extra spatial code. I mean, suppose you have a big customer database. Suppose you have millions of customers with geocoded addresses. Suppose you're Walmart, right? And for marketing purposes, you want to know the income and education of your customers. And you can't get that from point of sale records, but you could run a survey. That'd be expensive, duplicative, because there's actually already a survey about income and education level. It's called the US Census. 
But your point of sale data doesn't have that, doesn't have a foreign key linking it to census tracts. How do you get the census information on your customer records? You use the universal key, you use location. Every customer has a location, that location falls in a census tract. So you can join the customers to the census using a spatial relationship condition. And how many lines of code do you suppose that will take? One, yes, just like that. Let's spit out a table that adds census data to your uh, customers and you could pipe that into statistical analysis to get some more information about it. And the spatial type in PostGIS, and this is fairly unique, um, is fully integrated in the query planner. This is one of the things we can do because Postgres is so often it allows its third party types to actually get right into the core. So we're integrating the query planner. You can run really complex queries with multiple joins, including non-spatial and spatial uh, restrictions, and it will correctly plan it out. And you get an efficient query. Try it on MySQL. I'll get back to me in a week when it's done. You can use basic functions. So lengths, distance, uh, D within, area, intersects. These are all simple spatial predicates you find in the open, open geospatial simple features for SQL spec. You can use basic input-output formats. So these are the inputs, taking geometries and turning them into text binary. Oh, and bringing them back in from text and binary. So these are the basic functions as defined by SFSQL. But there's also more fun formats. Uh, there's JSON outputs. GML outputs, XML outputs, and there's also inputs. Inputs from GML, inputs from KML. I'm actually missing a line. There's inputs from JSON as well now. So that's lots of good input-output functions. Uh, once you have your geometries in, you can do more advanced analytics. This is stuff which is not part of SFSQL, but it's really useful when you're doing practical GIS. Take an object and buffer it. Take a set of points, make them into a line. Take a set of lines, make them into a polygon in two ways or take a set of polygons and melt them into a bigger polygon. So, for example, if you had a lake and you sent someone out to measure that lake by walking around the edge of it with a GPS unit, you'd get back a set of points. You could turn those points into a line with ST make line, and you could turn that line into an area with ST build area, and you would then turn your data, your raw data, from simple GPS tracks into a polygon which you can map and show as an area. Yes, the union function, really cool function. This one takes small things and melts them up into big things. So in this case, it's taking the 3,000 odd counties of the United States and melting them up into the 50 states. Well, 48 in that case. Um, the union function in PostGIS is actually quietly under the covers, a special union. Uh, it's a cascaded union. It was built that way because someone sent us this example on the left and said, why is the union so slow? And we said, because your data is crazy. But that wasn't really a good answer. The answer is um, we need to process the data in a more sensible way. So we ended up building Cascaded Union to do that. This is how Cascaded Union works. And it takes the data that's to be unioned, and it figures out the things which are next to each other, and unions those first. And then unions the things that are next to each other, then unions the things that are next to each other until it's done. The result is that each successive unioning step results in fewer and fewer vertices. So they go faster and faster as you work your way up the tree. It's basically a tree. Similarly, uh, when you do queries that use intersects or contains or within, under the covers, there is an optimization in PostGIS, which is taking advantage of the fact that most of these things, like this is a spatial join, most of these spatial joins involve keeping one side of the operation constant and iterating through the other side, flipping through it really quickly and doing comparisons. And if you know that's going to happen, you can keep this constant side and add information to it. And what we do is we add an index to the top of it. So instead of, for example, in a naive point polygon test, instead of doing a ray trace and having to iterate all the way through the rings to find out how many edges intersect our ray, that's how you do a point and polygon test, we can use an overarching index. Instead of taking order of n, checking every edge, we can do order log n by building an index on top of the object and then holding that in index through the whole query. So we use prepared geometry. You don't need to know this to use it. It just happens magically underneath. Fun GIS stuff. So how many people are, would describe themselves as GIS people? Fairly substantial portion. Um, you may, in your GIS training, have heard about linear referencing, or if you're using Esri tools, they, we've called it dynamic segmentation, perhaps. That was the old term of art. Um, you can do linear referencing in PostGIS. It's a way of modeling data that has relationships along linear features. So transportation guys like to use it a lot for asset management. They'll say sell things like, uh, 
the bridge is at mile 10.5, and rather than sticking a point at the bridge at mile 10.5, they'll stick a record in that says, bridge, 10.5 up, highway 12, and then for highway 12, they have the geometry. And in order to be able to go in and out of that kind of representation, you need linear referencing functions. So post just provides functions that, given a point in line, will tell you how far along the line the point is, and given a line in measurement, will extract the point back out for you. You can do the same thing with ranges, uh, fisheries guys like this. Um, they will have a single stream network, uh, but then on top of that stream network, they will have thousands of observations of, say, fishery presence and absence. And you would not want to manage that as thousands of little lines, because if you ever have a change in your underlying stream network, then you have to change thousands of little lines. If all the stream presence and absence is modeled as ranges on the streams, then all you have to do is change the streams and the ranges move along with them. So there's the primitive functions used for linear referencing. Locate along and between. That finds where on the line points and lines are. Add measure allows you to take a line that has no measure and add measure to it. And line locate point, that's the reverse. It takes a line and a measure and spits back a point. In addition to the classic point line polygon types, which you find in the simple features for SQL, we support uh, the extended SQL MM types for uh, doing curves. Uh, SQL MM defines curves as... Uh, Circular arc interpolations, so not Bezier's or splines, just circular arcs. But within that restriction, you can do all sorts of fun things. A curve string, which is made up only of curves. A compound curve, which is made up of combinations of curves and straight things. Curve polygon is a closed ring. Closed compound curve, actually. And then we have these crazy functions. Because your model may not understand curvy things, we have this idea of curve to line. So take a curvy thing and turn it into the linear representation which appears to be the same as the input curve. And because sometimes people linearize things and then regret it, we have line to curve, <laughs> which takes a set of equally spaced edges and attempts to extract the, uh, the curve back out from it. So curve to line does this, and line to curve does that. GS people, again, will be very happy to know that we support map reprojection in the database. Uh, ST Transform basically supports every projection you're ever likely to run into in your professional life. Really, and a whole bunch more that you won't. Like, you're not going to run into Krovac, right? You're not doing oil exploration in Russia, um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so there's no, no, no shortage of support for projections. For folks who are working on the round world, we have a geography type. So as of 1.5, as I mentioned. So geography type models data not on a plane, but on a sphere. And that's actually important uh, because the world, as it turns out, is not flat. Shocking. Um, classic plat carré projection, very problematic. Even stuff like, uh, it's it just not possible to represent really ordinary things. So if I draw a square around the North Pole, if I try to represent that in plat carré, it comes out like that, which is probably not what I meant. Um, or if I try to represent a circle around Hawaii in Plat Carré, it will be interpreted like that, which again is probably not what I meant. So planar coordinates, you've got to understand that in fact you're living on a globe. Um, adding that functionality is not something restricted to, uh, to scrappy open source projects. All kinds of companies have trouble with data that spans the date line. So, and there's a couple kind of users who find the geography type useful. And so the first thing that geo newbies um, who don't know anything about GIS or anything about map projections, they come in and they say, I've got these long coordinates. I just want to get them on a map. What do I do? And you don't want to have to tell them, oh, GIS 101. First, you figure out where you are. You might need a UTM projection. Depends on if you're in New York or California. It's good to have a type that just understands lat long natively. There's another kind of people who really need lat long. And those are people whose data actually covers the whole world. Um, and there are people like that. Anyone who spins things around the world is going to have data that covers the poles and the date line at the same time, and they cannot model their data on a plane. So the implementation of geography currently has relatively limited support. There's 300-odd functions in PostGIS. There's probably only 15 that are natively implemented for geography. Um, the indexes understand spherical data. That's an important one for access, very, very fast. Uh, ST intersects is native on the spheroid. Distance is native on the spheroid. D within, true or false, within a radius, native on the spheroid. <coughs> Area is native on the spheroid. And to make up for the fact that there are those 300 functions, most of which don't actually care whether your geometry is being interpreted on the plane or the sphere, um, we have casts. 
so you can cast a type from geography to geometry, run your geometry function on it, and then cast it back. And for lots of these functions, these are things like uh, count the number of points or give me the exterior ring. This is stuff which doesn't actually care whether the data is on a, on a plane or on a sphere. There's also a handy new geography function in 2.1, um, which takes a line like this one. This is a two vertex line, and it starts in LA and ends in Paris. And it densifies it, but it densifies it in geographic space, so that if you then plot it, plot it on a flat map, you can see the curve that the, uh, that the route actually takes in great circle space. So that's the, the route. So if you fly from LA to Paris, you end up going over Greenland. Loading data, uh, so before 1.5, this is how you loaded shapefile data. After 1.5, you got a GUI tool. Uh, the 2.0 version includes the ability to load multiple files in a batch, make a connection, choose which files you want to have, hit the import button, and up it goes. It also includes an export functionality. So you can connect, choose your tables, say OK, and it'll spit them out for you as shapefiles. So useful for training, useful for new users, easy ways to get your data into the database without any fancy third-party tools. Um, if you're still on PostGIS 1.5, and at this point I think no one is, so I can almost take this slide out, but please, please upgrade, because in 2.0 we added the idea of type mods, um, so that our geometries know what their dimensionality is and what their SRID is, which means that it's possible to do things like reproject data in place with one command, alter the table, change the type using a transformation, Really, really cool. It also means that the metadata table, the geometry columns table, which sits in all OGC uh, spatial databases, is now a view. It doesn't have to be manually managed anymore. Um, Oracle users will, re will recognize that it's still a manually managed table in Oracle. Ha ha. So that's what it looks like coming out of the view. Looks like just the same, just that it's always automatically there, there and correct. Uh, recent releases have had a lot of new support added in the 3D world. So we've got 3D types. So in addition to our points, lines, and polygons, our curvy things, we've also got actual 3D types, triangles, pins, which are collections of triangles, and polyhedral surfaces, which are actual volumes in 3Space. Once you have 3D types, it makes sense to have 3D-enabled functions to do fun calculations on those types. So distance, length, nearest points, uh, even tests of intersection and containment all done in 3Space. I point out, all this work has been done by folks in France at the company called Aslandia. Once you have 3D types, it also makes sense to have 3D formats, to be able to suck the types in from standard 3D formats and to spit them out as standard 3D formats. So you can spit your polyhedral services out as X3D. You can also spit them out as GML. GML3 understands polyhedral services. We also have standard text and binary outputs, but they're less fun. And once you have 3D objects, it makes sense to be able to index them in 3Space. So as of 2.0, when we got those 3D types, we also added an n-dimensional index operation. It is slightly slower than the two-dimensional operation because it has a variable length key. Well, at least we assume that's why, but it is slower. Um, but it does allow you to index both three- and four-dimensional types. Um, we ended up having to add a new operator, the triple ampersand, um, to push the n-dimensional index into place. But if you feed a pair of n-dimensional things in there and you have an index, the index will, th will go into place. A lot of that three-dimensional support is coming because we've added to the back ends underneath PostGIS. PostGIS has always been a uh, bringing together of a bunch of standard open source geospatial libraries, uh, the Proj library for projection, the Geos library for computational geometry. There's another open source computational ge geometry library out there. It's been around for a long time called Seagull. For a long time, we couldn't use it because of licensing, but that changed several years ago. And we've begun bringing Seagull functions in, both for 3D support and for more crazy function support. So using the Seagull library, we now have the 3D intersection function, which will take and intersect volumetrics, tessellations, 3D area calculations, taking 2D stuff and extruding it in 3Space, forcing orientations, and probably my favorite, the straight skeleton, which is great for turning polygons into equivalent lines. And because we have these two computational geometry libraries, it is actually now possible to choose which one is going to answer your question, at least for a few questions. So you can, at runtime, if you've compiled them both in, change which engine is going to fulfill your question. So for these 
functions, intersects, 3D intersect, intersects, intersection, area, distance, 3 distance. If you turn on GIOS, you get the GIOS version of the answer. If you turn on Seagull, you get the Seagull version of the answer. Scary stuff. 2.0 also brought in raster data. Um, in my considered opinion, raster is a stupid idea. <laughs> but uh, it has its place um, if you're doing analysis, if you are bringing your vectors together with your rasters, or if you are building relatively small or medium-sized dish queries of your rasters, it can be really convenient to be able to access it in SQL. Like, for example, if you had a, a digital elevation model um, and loaded it up into the raster model, you'd get this, well, you wouldn't get this. You'd get something that functionally is equivalent to this. You'd get the elevation cut into a bunch of little squares. And if you wanted to ask a question of those squares, like, um, given all the logging in this area, which logging is on steep slopes, you could answer it with a simple join. Joining the logging to the squares, which it intersects, masking the squares against the elevation, to determine just the cells which are inside the logging and then summarizing the cells inside each of those polygons. You get back a final summary answer which involves both vector and raster data coming together to give you a, an analytic result. So there's a lot of power to be had there in bringing raster and vector together in doing analysis in the database. Not so much if you just want to load images and pull them back out and look at them. That's a terrible idea. But if you're doing analysis, it can be a really powerful idea. Another extension beyond the basic vectors, topology. So uh, Post just works on a simple features model. That means uh, we understand points, lines, and polygons as distinct and separate objects. But in fact, they're often, polygons in particular, they're often uh, joined up. They understand each other as relationships of boundaries. So, you know, take, the, take all the provinces or states, I guess it is, in France. Um, you can think of them as independent polygons, but really they're, they're areas that are bounded by particular lines. And if you model them as such, as a topology, you can do things that are hard or impossible to do if you model them independently, like simplify the whole set while retaining boundary equivalence. Because instead of simplifying each polygon, you're simplifying each boundary between polygons. So they never get jaggy, they never overlap each other or cause gaps to come into place. Postgres 2.0 has support for nearest neighbor index searches. So for very large tables with irregular densities, this can be a big performance win. So for example, um, here's an example I did with genus data, two million points. Um, find one point, in this case, Reedy Creek. SQL looks like this, um, selecting the name, state, kind from the geonames, ordering by this funny operator. This tells it go into the index traversing nearest neighbor search. <coughs> this just finds Reedy Creek. And then limiting. There's really two important things about a nearest neighbor search in PostGIS. It's one, tell it to do it, and two, limit it. Because if you don't limit it, it'll give you the whole table back in sorted order which is not fast. On the other hand, getting the first 10 in sorted order can be really fast. So nine milliseconds, that's pretty darn good. Validity reporting has gotten better as we've gotten into the 2.0, 2.1 uh, era. It's important to have valid geometries because if they have invalid, invalid geometries, your computational geometry tests can give you the wrong results. So this is invalid because it's a banana polygon. Um, it touches itself right here. Um, this is the way it's supposed to be represented. Of course, what, what is wrong and what is right is actually a function of who you believe. Um, Esri says that's right. The OGC says that's right. There's no one's right. Just the models happen to have to be strictly enforced if the algorithm is going to work correctly. Um, it's now possible to get posters to tell you what's wrong by using the is valid reason as well as the is valid function. We've been able to say what's right or wrong, true or false, is it valid. Only recently have been able to tell you why it's invalid. Disconnected interior, self-intersection. Uh, as of 2.1 and recent versions of GIOS, you can also make things valid. So you don't have to hand fix your data anymore. You can just force them into compliance with the model. So taking this invalid Esri polygon and forcing it through make valid, you get back an OGC style valid polygon. So we've had curve types since uh, 1.2. Our curve supports getting more complete with these release. So you can convert curves to line strings and vice versa. Um, as of version 3.4, we've got Delaunay triangulization. So simple little tidbits. You can take polygon, turn it into its triangulized equivalent. Um, interruptibility has been the function that's been added since 2.1 and through 2.2. This is really important for my employers, CardDB. When you're running your database in the cloud, you don't want a user to have the ability to run an infinitely long process on you without being able to interrupt it. So every function in PostGIS and GIOS is now interruptible. 
And 2.1 brought in lots and lots of performance. That was the main feature uh, added in 2.1. So ST Union got faster for rasters. Geography distance got much faster, 20, 30 times faster. Uh, dumping all the points out of geometry about 10 times faster because that became a native implementation. The new R tree splitting algorithm made uh, R tree access 30, 20 to 30 times fast, 30% faster. And we added better ND and geography statistics, which made complex queries get 20 or 30% faster. In 2.2, Coming soon, um, new raster handling, so you can retile an overview inside the database. No more round trips through GIOS to do tiling and overviews. You can do raster reprojection in the database. Again, no more round tripping to, uh, to Google. Seagull function support, more and more Seagull functions as we go through. And, uh, and for people who are working with the Google Maps format, these, this, their funny encoded polyline format is useful for pushing data in and out of web maps. And finally, GML support for curve linear. Oh, yeah. Enhanced GML support for curves. Uh, another one coming soon. This is the one I just added yesterday. So Polygon, this is a, this is a Polygon that has how many points? 900,000 <laughs> points in it. 14 megabytes worth of Polygon. This is a performance nightmare um, if you want to do something, anything, even simple things. Point, point and Polygon test. Rip 900,000 points off the disk and add, ask at one point. Um, that's not good, particularly if your point's down here, or really anywhere. What you really want to do is have it cut into small chunks so that only a tiny bit comes off the disk and you can tell what, whether it's in there. So we've added the st subdivide function. It's a set returning function. It breaks big things up into small things. That's what it looks like chopped up or closer. It looks like this. Basically, it quadratically subdivides objects until they're smaller than the page size. Uh, when is 2.2 going to be released? Uh, I don't know. Um, we're getting more features, which means that we feel the urge to make a release. Um, but I think it's going to come down to some big feature which is so important that uh, the people feel they absolutely have, have to have it. Uh, we're probably not going to get recheck support because that's not coming until Postgres 9.5, I hope. Um, we are probably going to get some improved temporal data functions for people who are storing XYT and XYZT data. That's an old bullet. But what's going to be in 2.2 really comes down to you. Um, choose your own adventure. What features do you want? Uh, it's always good to hear. At this point, PostGIS is such a mature product, it's kind of hard to know what is useful to people. So our users are our most important guide to, to what's useful. There's also a couple of projects which aren't PostGIS proper, but are often related to them. Not strictly PostGIS, but extensions that rely on them. So point, PG Point Cloud, take a look at that if you're doing lots of LiDAR data modeling. PG Routing, take a look at that if you're dealing with uh, transportation gra graphs. There is a new book on PG Routing coming out in the new year. Uh, PG Routing, a practical guide. Keep an eye out for that at locatepress.com slash PG Routing. So you can add those features yourself. You can ask your trusted development partner. All glory to the Hypnotoad. No matter what, PostGIS has had a great 14-year start and is looking forward for the, to the next 14 years. So that's been the PostGIS feature frenzy. Thanks a lot. I have three minutes for questions. Sure. Oh, perhaps, I, perhaps I spoke too soon. Next question. Andrea. Not a great idea. Yes. Oh, you wouldn't retile an overview or DM data? I mean, there's lots of things which you might want to, to retile an overview. And yes, um, you're right. People are pushing, pushing their imagery into, a into the database. Yeah, but, um, I, I tell all time people, it's not a good idea, but they keep asking. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why they keep being added. <laughs> but by and large, there's not a lot of development interest in that, except, uh, except as people need it for analysis. And, the, the nice thing is that our raster developers have been driven by analytical needs, not by visualization needs. So we moved a little down that path, but not a lot down that path.
there, there's, there's competing poles there. Uh, on the one hand, people, as soon as the, as the system was put together, people immediately began abusing it um, by loading large quantities of data into it and trying to do bulk analysis operations on it, basically treating it like their desktop GIS in a bucket. And that's not the thing it's going to be most efficient at. It's going to be most efficient at smaller random access operations because it's a database. However, that's the way people use it. So we've been adding functions for that. Um, surface building, particularly now that we have a raster to store the surfaces on once we're done building them. Uh, clustering. Maybe even spatial statistics. These are all things that are actually on my docket for the next six months because I think we're finally getting into the next round of vector analysis. We've done the simple stuff, now let's do some fiddlier hard stuff. But they'll always be bound in some respect. It's not like you'll be able to analyze data in, in, with infinite size just because you put it in the magic bucket. It's not a magic bucket. <laughs> Last question? No problem. All right, thanks very much. <laughs>